from photographs taken by an unlikely source to undersea animals that act as the U.S. Navy's eyes beneath the waves, today's video will look at some of the most interesting times in history when unique animals were used in military service. At number 5 on our list of the strangest animals used in war come the Flaming War Pigs of Megara. Originating in India around 2000 BC, war elephants have long been used as a battlefield powerhouse capable of terrorizing even the most well-armed of ancient forces. Their large size, intelligence, and speed made them a powerful weapon that was strong enough to batter down gates and walls while being nearly impossible to stop using the limited weapons of the time. As these war elephants became more and more prevalent on the battlefield, it soon became apparent that an entirely new tactic would have to be used when countering the massive gray beasts of burden. While elephants are powerful, intelligent animals, they are prone to being easily spooked when confronted by loud, high-pitched noises. As a result, Roman legions, who often struggled to fight against the massive gray mammals, devised a genius idea to ward off any attacking elephants. Legionnaires would capture local pigs before hanging them from besieged walls, or setting large groups of the terrified creatures in the path of approaching armies on the ground. This is believed to have been highly effective as the attacking masses of elephants would panic at the sound of the squealing pigs and retreat in terror, trampling friendly soldiers as they went. This practice would prove effective for several hundred years until the wars of Justinian and, most notably, the siege of the Mesopotamian city of Edessa. However, despite these revelations, the use of pigs to ward off elephants was far from over. In 266 BC, defenders of the city of Megara would cross a new bridge in anti-elephant warfare. Macedonian soldiers under Antigonus Gennatus marched on the small city, preceded by a massive memory of war elephants. To save the city from imminent invasion, the Megarans gathered together a great horde of swine from across the city, covered them in pitch in the form of either pine tar or crude oil, and set them alight before sending the terror-stricken critters careening towards the Macedonian lines. The loud noises, heat, and general commotion formed by the fires caused the elephants to break ranks in fear, running from the burning pigs and crushing countless Macedonian soldiers. The Megarans were eventually forced to submit to the Macedonian commands, but flaming pigs, while immoral in many ways, were highly effective. Gennatus and the Macedonians could only finally thwart the threat of war pigs after they eventually learned to raise infant elephants alongside the pigs to ensure they weren't afraid of the squeaky squealing creatures. The Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC marked not only the first major battle between the Achaemenid Empire and Egypt, but also the first and quite likely the only time that cats have ever been used in combat. The conflict started between Egypt and Persia after Cambyses II of Persia requested a physician from the Egyptian leader Amasis II to assist him with an ongoing health problem. Amasis was happy to comply, sending one of his top physicians who quickly set about helping Cambyses to solve his medical woes. However, while this may seem like an innocent, well-intentioned act at first, and in all likelihood it was intended as such, it would act as the catalyst to one of the most significant battles in Egyptian history. The physician sent to Persia to help Cambyses had become enraged by the labor forced upon him by Amasis. In an act of revenge, he advised Cambyses to ask for one of Amasis' daughter's hands in marriage. Unwilling to let go of one of his daughters, but also unwilling to start a war with the Persians, Amasis sent the daughter of his predecessor, who he had previously overthrown, to Cambyses in the place of his daughter. Understandably perturbed at being sent off to marry a random foreigner who she had never met by a man who had murdered her father, Notitus, the young woman in question, immediately told Cambyses of the betrayal of Amasis, causing him to become enraged and launch an attack against Egypt. At the time, Amasis had developed bitterness towards one of his top advisors in military minds, Phanes of Halicarnassus. This hatred grew to the point where Amasis sent eunuchs after Phanes to capture him and bring him back to Amasis. Phanes eventually escaped, making his way to the Persian lines where he advised the Persian army regarding Egyptian tactics and strategies. Cambyses arrived in Egypt only to realize that Amasis had already died months before, leaving his son Samtik to defend alone with, without his top military advisor and with little experience. The Persians attacked the city of Pelusium in March 525, but met with harsh resistance in the form of siege engines that hurled missiles and stones and catapults that constantly pummeled them as they attacked. According to legend, it was then that Cambyses had what might have just been the best idea of his reign. 
war kitties. Just kidding. However, Egyptians did have a strong reverence for cats who they saw as a sort of higher life form symbolic of their goddess Bastet, goddess of pregnancy and birth, and, ironically, protector of Lower Egypt and the king. The Egyptians took this reverence for felines so seriously that the punishment for killing a cat was also death. Because of this reverence, Cambyses, as stated by Greek writer Polyanus, is said to have gathered all manner of cats and other beasts that the Egyptians found sacred and dispersed them across his front line. The Egyptians were then said to have stopped their counterattacks for fear of hurting the holy animals. As with most ancient history, this particular rendition of events has been subject to its fair share of scrutiny, notably because Polyanus, the historian credited with writing it down, was known to be a little bit of a fabulist. Still, Considering the Egyptians' conviction towards animals at the time, it does make sense. When Nadar took the first ever aerial photographs from his balloon in 1858, it opened up the world to an entirely new perspective that few people had ever seen. The subsequent publication of later photographs taken by fellow aeronauts in 1860 kicked off a mini-race to take high-quality location-specific photos from the air. This race resulted in the use of various other techniques, including using a kite to elevate small pre-time cameras, rocketry, and several other less successful methods. However, the most interesting development in early aerial photography came not in the form of a new advanced machine or any human contrivance at all, but rather a small, unassuming creature that has been serving mankind for more than 2,500 years. Dr. Julius Neubronner was an apothecary in the German town of Kronberg. To receive prescriptions more quickly for his many patients, Dr. Neobrunner would send for and receive his prescriptions from a nearby sanitarium using carrier pigeons that he kept at his practice. One day, one of the doctor's pigeons failed to return to him with the requested medicine, and he eventually presumed it was dead after it didn't reappear for more than a week. However, after four long weeks, the pigeon returned fully fed, looking as if it had been cared for well well away. This piqued the interest of Dr. Neobrunner, who also happened to be an amateur photographer. The doctor conducted a few rudimentary tests on a small ticket watch camera, during which he took pictures on a sled and a train to see how the small device worked when under motion. He then began developing a unique camera, intended to weigh no more than 50 to 75 grams, and able to be strapped onto the chest of a pigeon without impeding its ability to fly. While developing his camera, Dr. Neobrunner began training some of his pigeons by strapping small weights to their chest to simulate the weight of the cameras. After successfully creating his first camera, Neobrunner would test the new device by taking the camera strap pigeons 50 to 100 miles from their dovecote and having them fly back home. The pigeons, eager to get back to their roost and have the heavy cameras moved, would fly at a height of roughly 160 to 330 feet, unknowingly snapping pictures as they went. Dr. Neobrunner would continue to perfect his design, eventually going through 12 different variants before settling on his final variant. This dual lens camera weighed more than 40 grams and could take 12 pictures per flight using a pneumatic system to activate the camera automatically. Around this time, Neobrunner developed another important invention, the mobile dovecote. Pigeons are great carrier animals, but struggle heavily when their dovecote, or the small building that they are housed in, is moved as they have difficulty finding it. To counter this, Neobrunner built a dovecote on a wagon and trained the pigeons from an early age to return to the dovecote no matter where it was located. This gave him the ability to take pictures nearly anywhere he desired. Neobrunner would get a patent for his invention and even go on to present it at the International Photo Exhibition in Dresden in 1909 and later aviation exhibitions in Frankfurt where he would sell developed photographs as postcards. At the beginning of World War I, most aerial reconnaissance was done using airships, with further photography conducted using kites and rockets. While not directly controllable in their flight path, pigeons were much more predictable than both kites and rockets. Unlike their much larger airship counterparts, they could also fly much lower and closer to the enemy lines without getting targeted and shot down. Thus, in 1914, at the outset of the First World War, the German military acquired Dr. Neobrunner's pigeons to use in combat. The birds were tested for the first time in August 1914 at a practical test during a maneuver in Strasbourg. After acquiring the pigeons, the German army would test them further on the battlefield to satisfactory results. The pigeons even performed well under fire, showing little fear of the massive explosions and gunfire inherent to World War I. 
However, pigeon photography was short-lived as rapid advancements in aircraft made Germany's new multi-wing king of the skies into a surveillance machine vastly superior to anything previously seen. This doesn't mean pigeons were phased out entirely though, as plans for surveillance and even spy pigeons were floated around later in World War I and World War II. The German government even went so far as to create a toy reconnaissance pigeon and handler combo in the late 1930s. According to a Soviet army report from 1942, Soviet soldiers found trucks full of tiny pigeon cameras and dogs trained to carry the tiny birds, meaning that their use certainly seems to have gone further than we are currently aware. While photo pigeons were phased out rather quickly during World War I, one of Dr. Neo Brenner's related inventions, the mobile dovecote, would serve for the duration of the war as the German military built them in great numbers to house their carrier pigeons. Neo Brenner's method of training pigeons since adolescents to return to their dovecote no matter where they were located was also adopted by the Germans for their carrier pigeon program. Continuing with the theme of flying fauna, the next contender on our list is a rather warm World War II partnership between man and beast. After taking a trip to Carlsbad Caverns in early 1942 and observing the millions of bats living there, a dental surgeon from Irwin, Pennsylvania named Lytle S. Adams devised an unorthodox but highly innovative idea. Adams reasoned that under the right conditions, bats could be trained to carry small incendiary devices which could be used to light enemy cities and military emplacements ablaze. Adams noted that the bats were both extremely strong for their size and prone to roosting in dark and cool places such as the rafters of buildings during dawn and daylight hours. He further reasoned that because of their immense strength, Bats could be trained to carry small packages containing either explosives or incendiary devices, which, when timed correctly, would detonate or burn as soon as the bats landed to roost for the day. Most Japanese buildings intended as the target of Adam's new weapon were made of paper and wood, making them highly flammable. If enough bats were to be released, the hundreds or even thousands of possible fires could never be extinguished in time to save whatever target the hapless critters were released on. Adams also happened to be close personal friends with the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, to whom he wrote a letter explaining his idea. Adams' concept caught on in the White House, and soon it was approved for experimentation by the President himself. Under the command of the United States Army Air Force, Adams assembled a team and began experimenting to determine which species of bats and types of incendiary devices were the most effective. Trials soon determined that the Mexican free-tailed bat was the best candidate as it could carry 15 to 18 grams of explosives despite weighing only 14 grams. As far as armament was concerned, Adams at first set his eye on white phosphorus as the weapon of choice for the mini mammal missile, but soon changed his mind after Louis Fieser joined the team with his new invention, Napalm. The device used to drop the bats was a sheet metal tube 5 feet long with holes poked in the sides to allow them to breathe and keep them from overheating. Inside, the tube contained 26 circular trays which combined to hold roughly 1,040 bats. The bat bombs were intended to drop to a height of 1,200 meters before deploying a parachute. The sides of the device would then fall away, allowing the bats to disperse and deploy their deadly payloads. The first test of Adams incendiary bats occurred at the Carlsbad Army Airfield Auxiliary Base in New Mexico. The project started smoothly, but ran into a bump in the road when some bats escaped the test area and assembled under a nearby gas tank, resulting in the test range's incineration. The project was passed to the Navy in August of 1943 and renamed Project X-Ray before being handed off to the Marines soon after and moved to El Centro, California. The bats were tested in a real-world environment later that year when the first canister was dropped over the Japanese village a mock-up of an actual Japanese city built at Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. The project was immediately deemed a success as each load of bat bombs could set fire to as many as a projected 3,625 to 4,748 separate points as opposed to the only 167 to 400 set by a typical incendiary bomb load. However, despite these successes, the project had been a slow process, and it was clear that vastly more time was required to not only finish the experimentation, but also to breed the required number of bats necessary to make a large-scale operation feasible. As a result of this, as well as the continued development of the atomic bomb, Admiral Ernest J. King cancelled the project in mid-1944 after determining that it would not be ready by the end of the war. 
Nevertheless, Project X-Ray is undoubtedly one of history's most unique animal-centric weapons. Because of the tests in Utah, it is safe to assume that the project would have been successful given more time to develop. Beginning in 1960, the United States Navy began an ambitious new program to train its latest recruits on the art of undersea warfare. The training included anti-mine and anti-personnel warfare along with undersea recovery. There was just one catch. These recruits weren't human. After observing the intelligence of dolphins and various other sea creatures during shows staged by aquariums such as the one in St. Augustine, Florida, the Navy began an ambitious new test program that would send a variety of different undersea animals such as sharks, rays, sea turtles, dolphins, and sea lions through a rigorous set of tests to determine if they were intelligent and capable of operating in the adverse conditions created by an undersea warfare environment. The Navy quickly settled on the top two candidates, bottlenose dolphins and sea lions, as the best options to fulfill their requirements. Navy professionals trained the dolphins to use their unique, highly sensitive sonar to detect mines, enemy divers, and friendly objects such as weapons lost over the side of ships. Similarly, sea lions with excellent underwater vision, particularly in low light and murky conditions, were trained to use their keen eyesight to identify objects that friendly divers, submersibles, or sonar may not otherwise be able to detect. Sea lions also have an exceptionally well-developed sense of hearing, which can help them in much the same way as the dolphin's sonar. After identifying an object, the animals were trained to deploy special buoys so that an accompanying set of humans on the surface could pull the object out of the water and either detonate it or recover it in the case of friendly devices. Making these animals even more valuable was the fact that a sea lion can dive as far as 900 feet, while a dolphin can dive up to 1,000, with extreme examples reaching as far as 1,600 feet. This is all without the need for specialized deep water training or the fear of decompression sickness when the animals return to the surface. During the Vietnam War, five dolphins were stationed at Cam Ranh Bay to help protect American shipping and ammunition depots from enemy divers and submersibles. Later on, during the Gulf War, six Navy Dolphins were sent to the Persian Gulf and used to guard ships in the Bahrain Harbor, where they defended U.S. capital ships from attack and escorted Kuwaiti oil tankers. American Dolphins would also provide similar services during the Iraq War. The Soviet military also tested Dolphins at their Kazakhya Bukta location near Sevastopol. It was from this location that a Soviet military beluga whale named Tichka escaped in both 1991 and 1992, gaining the admiration of nearby residents of the Turkish town Garza, who named him Aiden. The Soviet military dolphin program was passed to the Ukrainian Navy after the fall of the Soviet Union. Ukraine allegedly resurrected its program in 2012, but its operations base was taken over in Russia's 2014 invasion of Crimea. Those same dolphins may potentially currently be in use protecting the Russian naval base at Sevastopol. As for the American dolphins, despite having been hit by numbers and budget cuts and nearly losing the entire program in 2023, dolphins and sea lions still serve a crucial role in protecting the United States Navy. No underwater vehicle or dive suit has yet to prove to be anywhere near as capable as these brilliant aquatic creatures. As a result, we may see dolphins and sea lions continue to serve in the U.S. military well into the future. I hope you have enjoyed learning about these exciting times when strange animals were used in warfare. If you learned something from this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel for more similar subjects. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in our next episode of Topics of History.